this thing. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. This is our third concurrent session block for day two. Um, my name is Yan Michael Archer. I will be moderating this panel. I'm a doctoral student here at the University of Maryland School of Public Health in the, the Siege Center uh, run by Dr. Shakobi Wilson. So the title of this session is 30 Years On, uh, reflections from youth leaders growing up in the in the EJ movement, and of course, the 30 years on is, is a, a callback to the 1991 Environmental Justice Leadership, or sorry, and it was the, just the Environmental Leadership Conference Leadership Summit um, held in DC that that gave us so much uh, and and put so much of a framing and, and bounds around around the movement. There, so this this is kind of like a little teaser leading up to our keynote tomorrow. Which will be uh, we'll be hearing from some of the folks that were at that that landmark session. Um, but first, we're going to hear from the youth. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're definitely lucky to have youth leaders from all over the country joining us to discuss EJ. Um, that we're we're going to discuss EJ uprising against racism in the U.S. here and globally, maybe uh, and more. I'd love to begin with some brief intros. Um, if you could each kind of tell us who you are and what brought you into the EJ movement uh, and what organizations you might be working with today. So I'll go ahead and start with Lisa. Hi y'all, it's good to meet uh, everyone virtually kind of. Um, so my name is Lisa, I usually hear her pronouns. Um, I'm, currently in P I'm currently at Berkeley at a PhD program in ethnic studies, um, but I was born and raised in public housing projects in New York City. So that really framed how I sort of see the world and see things, right? Um, really quick story. Um, I grew up right next to a power plant, you know, with the huge smokestacks and the chimneys. And when I was younger, I actually thought that was a cloud maker. I was like, oh, here's where all the clouds come from. But no, it's actually just a it's actually just a power plant making pollution and making power, you know, what have you, right? And it wasn't until I got to college where I learned about the structural issues that sort of like made the lives of myself, my communities, my neighbors challenging, right? Um, and that's when I chose to get involved. And when I was in New York City, I was heavily involved in anti-gentrification work, um, specifically with um, this community called CAP, Organizing Asian Communities and the Justice for All Coalition, which organizes um, different kinds of tenants um, throughout the public housing projects in New York City. And I um, primarily was also involved in youth education through facilitation work through um, the Chinatown Youth Initiatives and the New York City Asian American Student Conference. And currently in the Bay Area, I was recently the volunteer coordinator for the Oakland Chinatown Coalition um, through the Asian Pacific Environmental Network. So that's like a huge alphabet soup, but I'll get into more later. Thanks. Great, I'll go over to Io next. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Io. I'm calling in from Durham, North Carolina. I'm using he to him pronouns. Um, I grew up in Mebane, uh, North Carolina. Um, which is in Alamance County, about 30 minutes west of Durham. Uh, in a community, um, seeing my parents and the neighbors uh, fighting against a highway project that was coming in uh, that would destroy the community, um, many homes, uh, this community being a, um, a predominantly African-American community and a low wealth community, low income community. Um, many oh, homes many home and many um, uh, historic churches. Um, that was back in uh, in the early 90s, 93 or so when I started. Um, from, from that was birthed an organization called West End Revitalization Association uh, that was founded by, by, by parents and concerned citizens in the area uh, in response to that. So I kind of grew up in the, in, the, in the shadow of EJ. Um, after college uh, graduation, I found myself living in, uh, um, in, in close to um, other EJ communities in Columbus, Ohio, and now in Durham. Um, impacted by the same or similar issues and always being people of color. Um, so now I've been doing uh, community work in um, some form or fashion for the last 20 years. Um, and after getting my master's in public administration from North Carolina Central uh, University, HBCU, and uh, 2013, um, I kind of jumped full time in my um, EJ um, career. Um, right now, I'm the director of clean energy and climate justice for West End Revitalization Association. And I serve on the board of um, Hall River Assembly um, and as board chair with NC Warren and as on the leadership team and on the board of uh, North Carolina Climate Justice Collective, uh, which has been a, um, a kind of a, a soup of intergenerational and interconnected 
uh, magic that we're turning into a uh, 501c3 right now. Um, it's great to be with everybody today. Thanks, Aya. Wawa, you're next up on my screen here. Hi, everyone. Really, really happy and really, really honored to be here. I will preface and say that my internet is a bit weird right now. I'm not sure what's going on, but if I'm pausing, I'll um, try to write up in the chat some of the things that I'm trying to say. But uh, my name is Wawa. Uh, I use she, hers pronouns, and I'm calling in from Queens, New York. Um, so I grew up in the quiet corner of the state of Connecticut, a really small agricultural town. Uh, my parents decided to locate there after immigrating from Kenya um, because it was an area that kind of mirrored home in a way. They both grew up on farms and uh, that was kind of my own um, introduction to the physical environment, not necessarily environmental justice. Um, I grew up gardening with my grandmother and mother and kind of having that connection with the land really facilitated a deep love with the land as well as um, a very real uh, disconnect I felt where in class we'd be talking about um, Black people's relationship with the land as being one of purely subjugation and one of purely um, one of disconnection. And I knew that wasn't the full story. I knew that wasn't the full story in the context of the lands of the United States, but also that wasn't the context across the diaspora. And that was something that really grounded me um, throughout my youth and still does. I ended up taking an environmental science class in high school. And my teacher actually ended up placing an environmental justice chapter within our curriculum that didn't exist and to this day to my knowledge still doesn't. And that was the first time that I was able to one recognize that the connections that I had with the land and the ancestral connection that I have with the land that has been passed down was a valid environmental one. But it also taught me that a lot of the experiences that many of my family have experienced in relocating to the United States were because of environmental racism, were in the fact that while most of my family decided to move to Worcester, Massachusetts, everyone that did and all my cousins have asthma. And I started seeing these connections um, in my course books, but they weren't being talked about. So that kind of led me um, when I decided to go to the University of Connecticut to look at these issues as well as look at food insecurity and the prevalence of food insecurity for particularly BIPOC students at um, college, college campuses and looking at uh, the disparities that exist in regards to um, the structures of many of these institutions weren't created in mind for underrepresented students. So as newer demographics do enter those spaces, a lot of the problems and social ills that their communities follow them and trying to figure out ways to ensure that college campuses and institutions are putting in place policies and opportunities for um, at-risk students to be able to be food secure. And that has um, grounded my work now as a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford. Um, so again, super happy to be here and honored. Thanks, Wawa. Bring us home, Carlos. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, I think we, we lost your audio. Oh, can yeah. everybody hear me again? Okay. So hi, everyone. Carlos Sanchez. I am a youth leader calling in from Baltimore. Maryland. I use him and he pronouns, and my journey for environmental started, um, justice started a little after um, middle school, um, a little story. Um, growing up, I actually was born with asthma, and so we um, really didn't really know um, like much about it, or, you know, I, I just didn't really put much thought about it, because, you know, kind of same thing what people mentioned, the type of um, you know, environment, when it comes to environment and environmental justice, those aren't really taught in schools and bad things like incinerators and other um, polluting industries are usually in placed in um, communities of color and low income, which is um, what like one of the communities where I grew up and, and still live at is which um, Lakeland surrounded by uh, um, other communities and, you know, there, we are. We do have a um, many a couple incinerators. We have um, a waste burning incinerator. We have a medical burning incinerator. We all have an open air coal pile, which is literally located next to a rec center and a playground where you know kids play at. 
And, you know, this is things that are all around the world and, you know, things that cause um, our communities um, to suffer. And this isn't a system that, you know, it isn't right. You know, clean air is a human right that is being violated, not in, just in Baltimore, but all around the world as well. And I joined the, um, I joined Free Your Voice and the South Baltimore Community Land Trust because we're um, a group that are focusing on being able to, you know, have our community have a say in these type of things, you know, trying to give the communities, all communities, what we need and what we deserve, um, like clean air, um, a better environment and the way that, you know, our communities aren't suffering from this environmental injustice. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, more, uh, oh, did, sorry. Did, did I cut you off? Uh, no, I was just saying I'll, I'll get more into it later on, but just really happy to be here. Yeah. Great. Thanks. We are getting a little bit of a crackle from your audio. I'm wondering if you may be turning off the video might help. Uh, Wawa, same thing. If you end up having some issues with, uh, with bandwidth, it might, it might help to turn off the video. Um, uh, but but great. So excellent. Thanks for those those wonderful introductions to, to who you are and how you got here. Uh, as I mentioned at the top, this is the 30th anniversary of that 1991 Environmental Leadership Summit, which gave us a lot of things. One of the th those things, or I should say 17 of those things, were the 17 Principles for Environmental Justice, which I have up on the screen here for the sake of the audience. Um, and so, so my question is, you know, if you were exposed to the, what, like, there's a lot, and, and Dr. Wilson can, can probably give a whole, and, and, and Omega and Brendan can give a whole history on the environmental justice movement and, and gatekeeping in, 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 within the environmental justice movement. But my question to you all as youth leaders who, who are here doing the work, um, if you had, did you have a formal introduction to these 17 principles of environmental justice? Or did you kind of find it along the way and, and you know, as you discovered them maybe later on, find out like, oh yeah, this is what I'm doing. This is what we're all about. Um, so I, I have these up here. I don't have to leave it up for the whole question, but, but um, I, I'll put the link in the chat as well for, for, for audience members. Um, so I'll, I'll start off with that question um, with Wawa and, and, and go on ahead. Well, easily put no. Um, no, I did not have a formal. Um, and I use formal in, in purely the academic sense because um, I'll explain that later. But in regards to my classrooms, in regards to understanding and giving a, a good um, holistic history lesson on the environmental justice movement, the tenets of environmental justice, and the way that it plays out today, no which might sound like a contradiction because I did say that I got that environmental justice chapter in high school in that uh, class, but that was purely uh, the definition, right? We didn't really go into the history. It was more so discussing the dynamics that play out and the fact that race is the number one, indicators of, uh, number one indicator of one's proximity to a toxic waste plant, for instance. It was all data. It wasn't really any storytelling aspect. I wasn't really able to make connections from the textbook, the connections that I made in seeing the fact that the places that are over police are also the places that are experiencing the most toxic waste and the most pollution. Those were connections that I made myself in the communities that I have found home since then. Um, and, and in regards to the introduction outside of the classroom, it's really was through, I went to the University of Connecticut as an undergrad and felt as though like the Hartford environmental justice community really took me under their wing and really taught me so much about the history of the city, the history of the incinerator that has plagued um, black and brown communities there for decades and hasn't been taken down fully. Um, it was really in community organizing settings. It was through elders taking me under their wings, through organizing with other youth that I really got the holistic um, education and I'm still learning. And um, I, I, it's a huge issue within the environmental studies, environmental sciences, departments, ecology, conservation, all of it. Um, these departments, these, these places are really meant to serve the next generation in solving the biggest crisis that humanity really has to deal with, and that is the climate crisis. And they simply 
are not integrating uh, the importance of critical race theory of um, black radical thought, black joy and understanding how those concepts are so fundamental to really facilitating and ensuring that we have a just climate future. And I, I mean, I've written about this extensively as well, about the need, for instance, for environmental studies to really own up to the erasure of um, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. And it's a huge problem that I haven't really seen um, done right in the institutions that I've been a part of. I'll call them out right now. <laughs> University of Connecticut, University of Oxford, the geography departments I've been in have never had any folks of color um, <laughs> teaching, let alone us investigating the work of folks of color, which is why I think it's so important for those of us that are in those spaces to be radical in the way that we take up that space. And sometimes that means exclusively citing the work of black and indigenous and other people of color, scholars that are doing revolutionary work every single day like Dr. Wilson, and really making sure that we're grounding that in our work and also making sure that our work reflects other things that got us at least for me as a youth, as a, as a little newbie in the EJ space, um, got us and will hopefully continue to have us um, there. Thanks, Wawa. Lisa, I wanna to go to you next. Okay, sure. Um, so how did I learn about this? So um, as an undergraduate, I ended up at CUNY Brooklyn College um, and CUNY is the city university um, system of New York, so which is a public school system. And I was really lucky to find myself under the wing of um, Kenneth Gould, who had been teaching environmental justice classes since the 90s, right? Um, so as someone who you know, grew up in like with in very in a very precarious environment um, with violence both inside and outside the household, I really like to find my life. I used to go to school as like a way to avoid like real life things, right? Like if I could do well in school, I can do well, whatever, you know, just the way that I was like taught, right? But then in his class, I realized like, oh, like the stuff I learned in school and in like as an environmental justice class, like cannot, should not be divorced from my lived realities, right? Like there's a reason that I, as like a um, low income person of color, like grew up like in, like near a, near a, um, it's like a power plant, right? And I recognize that spaces are racialized differently. And I, as a Chinese person who ended up in a black community, just that that defined how I lived and how I grew up, right? Um, so this is where I really sort of like when I when I read these principles for the first time, that was when I like really like felt seen, right? Because this is a future where I want to imagine like a safer space for all of us, right? Regardless of race, how, how regardless of how we're racialized, of how we're gendered. Um, a safe place for all us to like truly like live work and play right um and for a long time now i like identify primarily as a role of an as a role of the educator facilitator um because i just really see it as like my role to funnel people towards like different movement spaces right because like as someone who grew up you know um mostly surrounded by people of color and like i think that's where my talent is, is just like really just um, providing spaces for people to learn about themselves and their histories and how um, they end up in these spaces and how they can become empowered, right? So for um, me personally, the, the fifth principle of environmental justice, um, I'll just read it quick, quickly. Environmental justice affirms the fundamental right to political, economic, cultural, and environmental self-determination for all peoples, right? So I really, really, really believe in the power of education, um, specifically as right now, as an ethnic studies student, um, I'm really lucky to be in the spaces that I am in right now, right? Because I really believe that education can empower people and people should have the power to dictate how they wanna live their lives beyond systems that create these environmental injustices, right? So like beyond systems of racial capitalism, settler colonialism, patriarchy, et cetera, right? And for me personally, I found that the first step to empower people is to give people hope, right? And I've personally seen how like knowledge and education like beyond or within traditional academic spaces can be used to like instill hope and like empower people um, in their scenarios and how that is used to effective to um, create effective change, right? Um, yeah, so that's my spiel. Excellent, thank you, thank you. Uh, we'll go Io and then Carlos. Um, well, for me, the, the seventeen principles of uh, environmental justice I never encountered in an academic setting. I went to undergrad at Appalachian State University here in North Carolina and. Um, later on at uh, North Carolina Central University for grad school. And uh, never at either place it, did I encounter any, um, my academic track wasn't really on, on EJ, but at the same time, I didn't see anything that bumped up against that in my academic studies. 
Um, my encounters with the 17 principles came, uh, I guess, from, from practice and growing up as a kid and seeing my mom and dad and folks in my community um, living and acting these things out. They weren't written down, but you could see that that's what they were doing, breaking down the actions that they were taking, what they were saying, what they were doing and treating each other, how they were treating each other. Later on, after I graduated from my um, master's degree, um, I joined the uh, staff of the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network. Um, and I saw the same things there. And we would have a um, EJ summit every year in October. And it was there in the back of the program that I really saw um, these 17 principles um, outlined in print for the first time. Um, but for me, uh, I think uh, the 17 principles uh, define exactly what environmental justice is. And from a um, people of color and in, in an indigenous perspective, which is, I think is a valid one. And um, um, from the original stewards of this land and it's one that should be respected. Um, the 16th principle stands out to me. Um, it kind of formed the way that I've walked about my career. And it says education of present and future generations, which emphasize social and environmental issues based on experiences and an appreciation of our diverse cultural perspectives. So um, during my career and through my time is professionally as a, as a um, EJ um, wor worker or what do you want to call it. <laughs> um, I've had the opportunity to build coalitions and I think um, working in teams with other folks um, and coalitions and collaborations to answer these various EJ issues is, is important and nothing exists in a silo and walking forward together in solidarity and, and unity um, among and despite differences is a key to answering all these questions, these issues. Um, so I've got a chance to work on uh, rural issues um, like coal ash and pipelines and um, wood pellets and those kinds of things. With a lot of folks as you, that you'd see, um, if you've gotten a chance to see the um, 1991 first um, National Peoples of Color Environmental Leadership um, Conference in DC. Uh, people like uh, Donna Chavis and uh, Vernie Smiller Travis and Dr. Robert Bullock, people that I've encountered and worked with some, on some level or another, or even just met um, to uh, really flesh out these principles in my own work. Um, and of course, um, being fortunate to be around my mom and dad, um, I'm making Brenda Wilson is always helpful. Uh, <laughs> but to me, EJ work is community work. Like I touched on before, it's, it's solidarity work, it's unity work. Um, the first National Peoples of Color um, Environmental Leadership Summit, Summit shows us that. And the 17 principles is something that we can hold on to to um, highlight that in, in our everyday work and how we relate to each other and work together. Thanks, Carlos, to add. Yeah, so, um, you know, me being a you know, recent, um, recently graduating to junior, I haven't, I never really encountered a, the, you know, the 17 principles and the, you know, the times I've been in, in school. And, you know, these 17 principles, you know, it's really, you know, it's really important. It's really crucial to this movement. You know, it's really, um, the summit had a huge impact in this movement, not only being like a really important event and in it it literally like changed the meaning of environment and how like one experiences right environment is, is like one where one lives one works and you know does their act everyday activities and when i first encountered these 17 principles was when being in your voice you know we really learn more about how crucial it is to um to know these um 17 principles and the importance it has in this movement in everyday life um, the third one um, really sticks out to me, you know, reading it, just reading is, you know, environmental justice mandates the right to ethical balance and responsible uses of land and renewable resources in the interest of sustain sustainable planet for humans and, and other living things. You know, that's really one that really stands out to me because, you know, with all of these industry polluting industries, you know, and when they burn um, natural resources, especially in this continuous production of plastics and other harmful things that later get burnt, it's really, um, you know, it is harmful, you know, right? People, um, everybody suffers from this and it's literally in our air and that in our water and the land that we walk, it's literally everywhere. There is no way to, you know, avoid it unless something is done. And, you know, 
work um one of you know we um working with youth and other we um in baltimore we actually created um the first fair development plan for zero waste that follows those same 17 principles that were created right making sure that our all communities get everything it wants and deserves you know while upholding equity in all communities and this is something that you know it needs to be worldwide and be able to you know push forth the um, environmental justice so that everybody can be, it shouldn't be a way um, in either or, you know, coming, being where, where you live or where you come from determines, you know, how healthy your, you know, your, your, your air and your land is, it is, right? It's not right. And, you know, that should be changed, you know, really love what happened at the summit. That was a really important event. Thanks, Carlos. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I love that, you know, you have people who have, who were formally introduced to, to environmental justice in the classroom, um, and then others who, who came to it, just as you said, Io, through, through doing the work, through living the work. Um, and one thing that I like to point out to folks about the 17 principles is that you, you don't necessarily, I mean, when I, when I first encountered them, I, I looked at them as something that was in me all along. And, and that's not, and, and because I think that stems from that conference, from that summit being a kind of for the people, by the people convening. You know, these are, these are natural laws kind of written down. And by having the, the, the principles in hand, what it does, even if we didn't need to know that they existed for us to live them, it gives us something to hold an anchor to kind of hold on to and say, this isn't anything new. These things that we're demanding are not anything new. These are the same demands that, that, that people of color, black indigenous folks, uh, oppressed folks have always demanded. Um, so really, really great responses. And, and, and I'm really just, I'm geeking over here. Um, so, so moving on maybe to, and I'll throw, I'll throw the question as written, but I have a, a little bit of controversy that I'll add to it here. So, so what issues related to EJ and health disparities and climate inequities do you think are particular, that you, do you think youth are, are particularly taking the lead on and what environmental problems do you see youth prioritizing that older generations tend to not focus on? And a little bit of controversy I'll add in there is is what are the barriers to to kind of an intergenerational movement forward um as as we're attack we're all tackling the same issues ej climate justice health disparities so um so just to kind of recap what are youth really really taking the lead on uh what do all older generations of ej advocates tend to to leave off the ticket uh and what are some barriers you know why is why is that so so I'll, I'll go first to Carlos and then Io, Lisa, and Wawa. Yeah, so uh, what I'd say is, you know, youth are really working on and, you know, leading on a creating a food waste local infrastructure in Baltimore, i say. Um, you know, youth here are, you know, really, you know, um, older generations are tired, right? They, they, they fought for this system that you know it still isn't in place and so now it's youth who are you know standing up and showing that this you know let's push this further right let's be able to do let's let's make a change let's accomplish this change you know um the incinerator that i mentioned earlier it causes like 55 million in health damages and you know older generations were, were like you know really trying to find a new system and you know it's and Sadly, it hasn't been, right, it hasn't been, you know, pushed as, right, and so now youth are coming in and taking a lead in, you know, this on getting, building a local infrastructure, compost, you know, that real zero waste econo um, economic, I can't pronounce the word, you know, that zero waste alternative, right, and getting more, you know, door knocking, outreach, more hands-on hands-on um, approaches to um, this movement, ways that they can, you know, not only push this work further, but, you know, really be able to keep themselves moving and be able to accomplish things. Either, either if it's, you know, a big accomplishment or a little one, they've managed to, you know, push through, if, you know, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. Go ahead, go ahead, Ayo. 
Um, well, I've, I've um, been thinking about this question for a while. Um, this is my perspective of it. Um, I think uh, youth have um, really, uh, youth involvement has really been a boost uh, for the movement for clean energy and, and renewable sources. Um, I've seen youth, um, I know, especially on the local scale and um, here around the state of North Carolina, um, building uh, community gardens for to answer food security um, for and food security networks uh, to help feed their communities and um, doing things like uh, I know um, and one one um, particular instance um, the North Carolina Climate Justice Collective has a um, institute um, called um, the Energy Democracy Leadership Institute that we do and been doing in conjunction with uh, NC Warren. What we have is um, I think about twenty or 22 or so black and indigenous youth in Eastern North Carolina who've been um, honing and building their leadership skills um, to address EJ issues and lead their communities on EJ issues like um, wood pellet production and, and um, hog waste contamination out in Eastern North Carolina, um, which is a high um, um, demographic of um, um, people of color and, and indigenous communities. Um, and I think, as a youth myself, I'm not really that old, I'm just about 16 or so. <laughs> I think uh, we focus on um, the energy that we use as being green and renewable, uh, you know, where it's coming from, along with the, um, the methods that we use to um, consume it. I see a lot of times, um, um, you know, lately, in the past 10 years or so, um, we see a lot of things like with um, um, hybrid cars and stuff like that. And there are older generations who buy these things and they, you know, they feel comforted or satisfied that they're, um, you know, doing something for the movement. But I've always thought about, and especially as I've gotten into the ECJ, ECJ work, it's great that you have a hybrid car or whatever, but you maybe you're not it's using as much gasoline to drive that carbon down the road. But the electric generation that you put into that car, where is it coming from? Is it coming from a clean, renewable energy source, or is it coming from some car, some uh, uh, coal or uh, fracked gas that was burned along the way, and that's how you got that energy to supplement the gasoline that you put in your car? I think the youth are thinking about those issues on a deeper level. I also think the youth are more opened up about um, working. Um, through their differences. Um, and I think the world has opened up now and things are, you know, things are a lot more liberal. So uh, people can um, choose the pronoun that they want and uh, uh, sexual identity um, thing. Um, so use are, um, um, and those, I think those kinds of things would stop people from working together and um, it would force people into the, into the shadows because we might be able to work on this EJ issue or this social justice issue with voting or whatever it is, but we can't deal with the fact that you may be gay or, 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 or whatever that you, you know, whatever, you know, whatever that is. Um, I think, but the youth now are, are come to a, a stage of um, accepting, accepting themselves and being proud of who they are and um, um, reaching across um, their differences to enjoy one another's cultures, to uh, be able to work together on these issues. Um, with their identity up front and center, with a respect for those identities up front and center, so that they can see each other and have respect for each other and do the work. I think that's been lacking in the, in the, in the movement um, in generation before. It's easy to do that. So it, you're showing us the way on how to do that. Sorry, sorry I uh, think we're, we're losing you a little bit. Um, but but really great points. I'm, I'm really glad that you you made the point about, about being... Um, you know, youth activists and, and advocates being able to, to be their, their truest and fullest selves in, in the movement today in a way that maybe older generations were not able to be. Right. Um, great, great. So uh, let, me, let me go over to Lisa now. Yeah, so um, I can only really speak to my personal experiences and my limited understanding to my networks, um, having only lived in pretty much urban areas. Um, so, and with very limited understandings of the movement on a digital scale, but I think something that I've noticed the youth really taking lead on is like 
the anti-gentrification work happening in both the Bay Area and in New York City in, in um, Black, Latinx, and Asian um, neighborhoods. Like, I don't know how we define youth, like I think below 35, I think that's how people have defined it, but I don't know. If, but we, anyways, so um, I uh, really think and see gentrification as an environmental justice issue because it, per, it creates housing instability, right? Um, and I've seen that issues of gentrification are in particular are extremely divisive across generational lines in differently racialized communities, right? Um, and like, for, for example, like a lot of like capital intensive projects um, that have the potential to displace people, especially in racialized and underfunded communities, right? They often tend to promote um, short-term wins for extremely long-term losses, right? Um, and I think, you know, for the young, for from what I've noticed, like the older generations would generally focus um, particularly on like the short-term wins, right? But generally not, oh God, this is kind of a controversial statement. <laughs> um, uh, think not, mm, they will prioritize the short-term wins as opposed to like the um, long-term losses, right? For the needs of the, for the needs of the community, right? For example, um, opening a sports stadium in Chinatown, it's, you know, it's great because for short-term because the community will get jobs and money and whatnot. But in the long term, it will eventually displace people, which is what we've seen happen in DC's Chinatown. We've seen open up there, right? And even more, it's like super duper challenging for, for, um, to track the wins of like anti gentrification campaigns, but so much more easily to track the losses because that's when like because losses like actively like displace and harm people, right? Um, another example in Long Island City, my home neighborhood, like Amazon was going to build headquarters there. Um, but then they eventually didn't come because all the people organized and then they won and they didn't come and that was a win, right? But like, what do we have to like show for it, right? Like we're still suffering, we're still poor, things like that, right? Um, yeah, so, you know, these issues are tough and from just from, from what I've seen, like the, I've really seen youth leading the stuff on like the anti-gentrification and imagining like a better future, like beyond um, the alternatives that like, um, uh, people who create these capital intensive projects like present to us right like there are ways that we can imagine futures beyond you know chasing capital right beyond the short-term wins like even though our communities are under resourced and needs like there's a way that we can meet the needs of our communities in both short-term and long-term right and I think that's something that I find really um really um inspiring and powerful like when speaking with um youth I don't know how are you define youth so yeah, I, th I think zero to 35 works for me. <laughs> uh, Wawa, what, what, what about you? Yeah, um, so, I mean, I feel like it's important to preface um, like my understanding of, of the EJ movement and my experiences with the understanding that, you know, I'm a youth, I guess I'm a youth, I'm 22, um, but everything that the youth are able to do is based off is, um, off the backs of the elders in the movement and folks that have come before us. And I think um, something that gets lost in a lot of the conversation of, I don't really know if it's as frequent within the climate uh, environmental space, but definitely generally, there's a lot of talk on intergenerational rifts that exist between like, for instance, like the okay boomer um, phrase and things like that. I think what's different in my perspective is that um, I don't really feel like that riff necessarily is, um, exists in the same way that I see people talking about it, at least in the spaces that I've been in. Um, it's very much a very knowing understanding that all the things that I guess we are saying that youth are able to do now is based off of the language and foundational um, building blocks that um, the generations before have put up and are continuing to build upon. And we're just working on with and alongside them. Um, I would say like the most obvious thing that youth are prioritizing is um, I guess like changing the narratives around um, climate and environment um, in like a mainstream way. I think it's difficult to say that um, like youth are coming up with more radical um, ways of I, thinking about a future for me um, when a lot of the elders that I've learned from have been talking about these things for a long time and perhaps weren't given a platform. I think what's different is that youth are really creating their own platforms and that's by uh, 
that's by means of social media and uh, digital strategy that youth, um, by and large, we grew up in a digital age. So we're able to navigate those spaces uh, more and uh, potentially do it more successfully. I think also um, we have an advantage in the digital space of being highly adaptable um, and learning how to organize, um, how to gather people together digitally or in person and um, in really new ways. Um, I'd say the other thing is um, I see a lot of, especially other like black and indigenous and people of color, like youth deciding that like the big green environmental organizations aren't necessarily the one, only ones that we see as the, I don't know, at least for me in my academic experience, it was very, um, it was very clear as to what a career would look like in working in the environmental space and integrating other forms of justice there were kind of seen as not necessarily compatible. And I think youth are really changing the script on that. There's a lot of um, youth BIPOC-led um, organizations that have been around for quite some time and are popping up. I recently founded an organization, Black Girl Environmentalists, which is um, grounded on the principles of environmental justice and center um, the voices of Black non-men. Um, and to my understanding, an organization like that um, hasn't existed thus far. Um, so I think we're, we're getting more creative on ways to get people involved. And um, like was said before, we're getting more creative with, I guess, reaching across the aisle with other um, movements, at least from a mainstream point of view, um, and are perhaps um, because of digital influence are able to um, get more attention on environmental justice than has before. And again, that's not to undermine the work that has come before, but there's a real transition, I think, in environmental justice being um, more readily acknowledged than um, it has been in the past. Excellent, absolutely. I think that that actually cues us up for the next question perfectly. And, and Io kind of um, brought this in a little bit uh, earlier, but, but when we're talking about that intersectionality and, and the layering of issues, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with, at a time, you know, initially, and, and, some, and in some ways too, when we look back to 1991, environmental justice, while, while very covering, you know, a range of environmental health hazard and environmental issues, was, was narrow in, in certain other aspects with, re, with re, regard to, um, I mean, the principles lay it all out, really, honestly, but in terms of how we took that and used it for, for that decade of the 90s in the mainstream, what we saw was mostly kind of you know a lot of landfill issues, water issues, and 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 uh, you know air issues and things like that. And now the environmental movement, um, you know, as it's being pushed, uh, particularly in in younger spaces and by younger voices, includes housing inequality, includes uh, you know on the face gender, uh, LGBTQ issues, right? Identity, all these identity issues. So so I you spoke a little bit about this. I'd love to hear. Uh, the other panelists kind of talk about the the intersectionality of of environmental justice today. Do you see it as as something that's that's new for for this era, or do you you know you see it's it's always been there? And I I guess I should tell you who who's going to go first. Uh, let's start with Lisa. Yeah, I think. Okay, so this is something I've actually been thinking about a lot, and I'll preface this with a short story. So I was um, at a conference and I was talking about the role of Asian Americans in the environmental justice movement, because that's often not talked about for X, Y, Z reasons, right? Um, and someone asked me a question, like, if Asian Americans are doing environmental justice work, like, for example, in housing issues, like housing work, like, why does it matter that they do or do not call themselves environmental justice people, right? Um, and then upon like working and just working for and to various like um, specifically like Chinese and black um, different organizations, I realized and just doing in doing my research about the 1991 conference, because um, I've read like a lot about it, wrote my thesis on this conference. So I like, I like, I'm just like, oh my God. Anyways, so um, I'm realizing now that like um, with just 
just from the stuff I learned um, in reading about the conference itself um, and um, my experiences in these places that um, the power is really in like the networks, right? So like how you identify really determines the networks that you're a part of, which determines the coalitions you build and which shapes how you're able to build power and to create change, right? Not that this is all like a linear process, right? It's like a really like chaotic process, you know, because identities are um, complicated and they're changing and they're shifting, you know, as they should be, because, you know, the world's always changing. You learn more about yourself and your communities and whatever. Um, but I think that's like really important now, right? And like, um, and sort of in direct response to why like we need like the intersectionality aside from like the need to build coalition. Um, I think in short, like we really need like an intersectional approach, like taking taking into account like race, gender, class, what have you, right? Um, because at the end of the day, we just don't want to perpetuate or just place harm onto other people and onto other communities, right? Um, and um, because otherwise you risk becoming, oh God, this is a big statement. Otherwise you risk becoming a part of like white supremacy. We don't take an intersectional approach to work, right? Because like example, brief, brief, brief explanation, like white supremacy says the rich, this racialized people is, are these things, right? And then these gendered people are these things. And that's how we are taught, like even as racialized and gendered people to maintain control of these systems, right? Like this is like, you have to do this and this and this and this to become powerful to blah, 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 whatever, right? Right. And as long as like marginal and marginalized or racialized and gendered communities hold these thoughts, right? And we're not truly inclusive in our analysis and the work that we do, like we can never really be free from these systems because you know, one pops, you know, like let's say we get rid of like one system and then the other one just pop up. You know what I mean? So that's why like an intersectional approach is like extremely it's, it's central and integral to the work that we do, right? Because otherwise, like you're just you're gonna end up displacing harm on other people and that's not fantastic. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Wawa. Oh, we can't hear you. Can you receive the question one more time, please? Sure, sure. So talk, talking about an intersectionality in the environmental justice movement today, if it's if it's you know to you noticeably different than intersectionality or the or the movement writ large in the past, uh, and and what does that do? What does that mean? Okay. Yes. Um, so I don't know if I can totally answer this. Um, ah, sorry. I don't know if I can totally answer it in framing it on a comparison because I simply don't know. Um, I feel like I can talk about what. I know in regards to what I've heard and things that I've read, but again, I I don't think I can totally make that comparison. I don't know if I'm actually um, if I've, I have the agency to do so. Um, but yeah, um, <laughs> I, I remember why I just asked you to say that again because I was just struggling to like figure out how to respond to that. But in regards to what's happening now. Um, I, it's interesting because for me in the EJ spaces, I've been doing a lot of digital organizing for the past um, two, two years because we kind of have had to. Um, and in all the different people that I've been working with um, in the US and also across the diaspora, intersectionality has just been, it's always been there. Like we, we are almost not approaching each other with how do we include intersectional theory within our work, it's already a given. And it's been interesting because the people that, the people in coalitions that um, I've been a part of and worked alongside have really not necessarily been those that have been conventionally understood or included within environmental coalitions. I mean, I don't know totally, but um, you know, like for me, we're working alongside abolitionists um, when we're thinking about um, facilitating a just climate future. Uh, we're not just thinking about a, a world free of climate disaster, um, but we're thinking about a world that's free of a carceral landscape. And that means so many different things. And that also means that the people that we are working alongside and learning from have this same language. And for us, it feels um, almost intuitive, I guess, to have people working on the nexus of, of gender inequality, uh, racial injustice, um, abolition, um, 
uh, gentrification, anti-gentrification efforts, it just feels for us like a given because when we're thinking about a future that for us as youth hasn't always been promised. And that's also something that has existed long before the climate crisis, obviously with their communities. But in regards to climate disaster being um, presented as this inevitable future, I think when it comes for us um, conceptualizing what future looks like in the midst of all of that, um, I think we're getting really creative in the, in the people that we're including and, and building alongside. Um, but again, I, I can't say that that hasn't been happening before. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Carlos. Hi. Yeah. So um, to answer the um, same thing, I don't know if I, I will be able to answer the question fully, but I will try my best. But I will say that, you know, in terms of intersection, um, intersectionally, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's been like ne necessarily always there, right? But it is important to take it as an intersectional approach because, you know, when we, we can see the way others experience these issues and that way we can help everyone and because, you know, not everybody experiences these issues the same way. Take in mind, you know, um, youth, right? For example, you know, many youth get looked down upon and most um, say that some or most youth are troublemakers or this and that and that their opinion doesn't matter. But in reality, um, um, what some people don't realize or some youth don't even realize themselves is that, you know, we have that natural, you know, instincts to go for, to achieve or aim for long goals, right? Long, long-term goals. And, you know, that at the end, in reality, makes their opinion and, you know, matter, right? It makes them, it gives them an important and major role because not only, right, now they are, they put their, um, because I know and have experienced as youth, you know, once they put their mind and heart into something, you know, they can, with the right resources, the right amount of support and the right help, they can accomplish anything, right? And, you know, that kind of kind of goes back to what I mentioned, you know, it is important to um, take an intersectional approach, you know, because not everybody experiences these issues the same way, but, you know, and we can really truly see how people, other experience experience experiences these issues and be able to help them in more ways that they and the way that they will that will help them um be able to you know achieve or um um you know deal with this issue thanks carlos io do you have anything to add before you go yeah yeah, yeah i'll say um i'll just answer the question this way uh i think um youth have been instrumental and they've been really great at harnessing uh, um new technology and um, to show us uh, these injustices. Um, and they, they also, they collectively move without fear. Um, I think we have to remember that it was the youth that showed us what happened to George Floyd. Um, they're using cell phones and social media and they gave us a first person point of view of these things happening. Um, one instance that I can think of is um, of youth um, showing up for strategic direct action uh, was, um, I think it was a couple of years ago, um, 15 minutes from where, I, from where I am in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, when they showed up on the campus of UNC, uh, the University of North Carolina at, in Chapel Hill, um, and confronted the fact that there was a um, Confederate monument um, on campus that had been there for almost 100 years, if not a little more. Um, I don't think anybody knew what was going on, or that this was going to happen, but it was supposed to be um, people showing up for protests, but these folks showed up, um, coordinated, and they took that thing down. And it's still down. That was the youth. Um, and um, I think that um, um, they realized that these injustices that we, that we face are, don't exist in a vacuum, and this, in, in this oppression that we face is interconnected. Um, the actions that they've been taking are gonna confront things like school to prison pipelines, which are related to poor infrastructure. Uh, which are related to um, environmental contamination and which is related to depressed property values and related to denial of political power and the uh, weaponization of black and brown bodies. Um, and that this, you, this, I've touched on it before, but the youth are, are being able to work together in a, in a more intergenerational, um, interconnected way across differences in, in identities um, to address these things in a collaborative, um, collective, inclusive manner. 
I know that um, one way that the um, North Carolina Climate Justice Collective has grown has been in the manner of engaging um, folks. It started as a summit, but now we're going to be turning into a, an, an organization, but engaging folks in that, in that same manner, that interconnected, intergenerational, um, interethnic, if that's a word, uh, manner. <laughs> Excellent. And, and I really, really love what you said about, you know, moving without fear. This, this fearlessness is not just, uh, it's not just a platitude. I mean, it sounds nice, but it's so powerful because not only can we not afford to kind of hem and haw and, and you know, we, we, we're not, uh, not afraid to blur these lines. When we're talking about in intersectionality, recognizing that we don't need to be as disconnected as, as we might have been in the past. And, and we're in, in fact, and indeed stronger um, by blurring some of these lines and crossing these these intersections. So excellent, excellent um, responses from all of you. We've got about four minutes before we flip it over to Q&A from the audience. Um, so that, this is kind of a reminder to audience folks, if you haven't yet, start dropping some questions in the chat for this great panel. Um, in those four minutes, really quickly, I would really love to hear about your influences, your inspirations, whether it's your peers, your colleagues, uh, mentors, uh, who, who do you, who or what do you want to shout out, um, you know, uh, as we, before we flip over to, to Q&A um, from the audience. And so I'll go first to Wawa. Oh, you're muted again. I feel like this is one that requires some thought because whenever people ask me that, I'm like, who, oh, I forget. Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, um, my parents, my ancestors, the ancestors that I know and the ones that I'll never be able to um, know. But, you know, I think with my parents and, and, and them leaving um, Kenya um, for a variety of different reasons and coming to this country in the midst of all of its complexities and all of its wrongdoings to them and other, other racialized people, um, their resiliency has definitely grounded me um, in who I am, while also giving me a peek into the resiliency that is just embedded within my DNA and within, um, you know, my family line. So, um, you know, always thanks up to, to the ancestors and um, those that have come and fought before, before me and us. Um, I would also say I'm big on family still, like my siblings. Um, my partner, just the people that remind me um, of why we fight. Um, I think we fight, I know that we fight because we love and um, it's in those spaces that I've learned what family is, what community is and what radical love is and what radical hope should be as a discipline and as a practice. Um, let's say it's my favorite authors like James Baldwin, um, Octavia Butler, um, and some of my favorite scholars, everyone from Dr. Dorcia Taylor to Dr. Bowler to Dr. Wilson, um, to some of my undergraduate um, professors and mentors, most of whom weren't in the environmental spaces, but still were able to provide me um, theoretical frameworks to base my work on, but also just kindness and friendship. Um, People like Dr. Phoebe Godfrey, um, Dr. L. Matt, um, people who believed in me and believed in my um, ideas and um, continue to believe in me. And I also say uh, my team at Black Girl Environmentalist, we started almost a year ago and um, they just constantly remind me of the importance of really just trusting our instincts as, as Black women, as black non-binary people, as black girls, um, as people that have constantly been put aside and decentralized. And I'm just constantly empowered and so lucky to be able to work alongside um, a team of family now who um, are grounded in the same values and have, um, and are just grounded in so much love and, and hope. And I, yeah, I just feel really lucky to be um, in their presence. Thanks. You weren't you weren't kidding about not wanting to leave anybody out, right? <laughs> That's excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go over to Io next. Um, 
what inspires me and my mentors. Um, my first mentors are my parents. I know, um, like I mentioned before, growing up in, in West End and in Nevin, Alamance County, North Carolina, and, um, and seeing these things happening. You know, my mom and dad were just able to like, you know, everybody else and they had careers and they went to work every day. My mom was a special education teacher and she'd done that for years. And uh, my dad had his own business, um, um, health and life insurance. He had clients all over the place. And it seems like he knows everybody now and even, even still. So they were doing that and um, um, raising us, me and my, my, brother, my two brothers, and we we're family and doing family stuff and doing that and going to church and everything. And the, but these things started happening. So they kind of, you know, took on this as a, like a second career with folks in the community and it just made time. They turned 24 hours into 48 hours in a day and just did more work. So they're my mentors, um, um, leaving something for a, another generation, something that's better for the next generation behind you. Um, I think um, my fuel to get going um, to do that work are my sons, um, Hailey, who's uh, 10 years old and they started fifth grade this week. Go Hailey, I gotta pick him up after this session. Um, <laughs> and um, my second king, his name is um, Ezekiel, I call him Zeke. He's um, almost four months old. Um, he's here in the picture. Um, The other reason why I do it, uh, so that, you know, like I mentioned before, uh, Wawa said we, we uh, fight because we love. So that's why I fight because I love them and uh, um, the children and, and folks that are in their, in their generation. So that there's something left um, for us um, here, um, for our descendants. Um, and we do that through connection with our ancestors, through the lessons that we learn from our ancestors. Uh, culturally, emotionally, and spiritually, mentally, uh, so that we can leave something behind physically. So that's what keeps me going. Thanks, Ayo. Uh, we'll go over to Lisa and then Carlos. Oh, geez, so many people. Um, but I guess I'll just keep it short. Like my academic advisors, um, both at um, Brooklyn College and UC Berkeley, um, I honestly think the fact that I've never attended the PWI and I fully just don't, I've mostly been in spaces of color. I think that really contributed to like, and the mentors I found there who really just encouraged me to like be my full chaotic self, but also reminding me to relax and breathe when I need to, because I talk really fast as you can probably figure it out at this point. Um, those people are the ones who keep me grounded, you know, um, and more specifically, um, this is, kind of silly and a little bit meta, but when I was younger, I, the way I move about these spaces, I always thought to myself that I want my future self to inspire my younger self. So I guess like my future me is an inspiration, which like doesn't make any sense, meta, whatever. Um, but I, the reason I think this way is because there are lots of younger people who are like me who grew up in the spaces that I grew up, who never really fit in anywhere for like the reasons that, you know, we're not like we were, we don't speak properly, we don't look the way that we're supposed to look, blah, blah, whatever, right? So I think like um, that's also something that I use myself to keep, I use to keep myself grounded, um, especially so, as someone who really identifies as, as an educator. Um, and also shout out to Charles Lee at the EPA, who is like super supportive of me and my work um, and all the elders in who were at the conference who like took time out of their day to speak to me about their experience there to really sort of like, um, from people who the elders who trust me with their stories to share them with like the next generation you know what I mean um so I'm really blessed to be like in community with so many people who teach me how to like move um with love right and um and yeah so I'm just really grateful to be in this space with y'all as well awesome bring it bring us home one last time Carlos <laughs> Gladly. So, um, and you know, some of my biggest inspirations are my parents, of course. They always support me and, you know, always wish me the best. And, you know, I know we all can relate almost. And so, um, my mentors, um, on the other hand, you know, they've been, they helped me with through many obstacles. Um, there are not um, only people who help me in more ways than I can count, but always believe in me. And I do, I'm pretty sure they are watching, so I am gonna use names. <laughs> so, um, you know, Melanie Thomas being one, I know her, although I know her as Ms. Mel, 
she always makes sure that me and my family get what we need and are safe, even if it's not, you know, um, work related. Um, Shoshana Campbell is, you know, as well. She's also one of my mentors. She's always pushing me on to be the best that she knows I can be. And, you know, Greg Sautel as well. He's um, always teaching me to strengthen my ideas and be able to push my ideas even further. You know, overall, you know, they have helped me and seen me grow and mature as a person and really able to accomplish big things like being on this panel today. Um, um, two um, people that keep me going on making sure that um, being able to push, um, accomplish this and be able to work through is, you know, my niece and nephew, um, they recently turned two and six months. And so, you know, being able to start a future and make sure that the plan is and the environment is good for them, you know, really keeps me going. Excellent. Thank you all very much for this really enjoyable panel. I, I loved it. I love connecting with you guys and hearing your, your, your responses and your voices. Um, Rose is my handy dandy helper for this room. And Rose, I'm not seeing any questions that have come in through the chat. Uh, did you see any on Whova? As of now, I do not see any on Whova. Okay. In the meantime, how do we how do we connect with all of you all? Um, you can drop your social handles on in the chat, or or you can say them out loud. Um, how do we get to, How do we follow you and 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 keep up with what you're up to? Uh, I'll start with with Lisa, uh, and then go Carlos, Wawa, and Io. Um, I don't really have a public presence. I'm working on my anxiety around that right now. Um, maybe Wawa has some advice for me on that. <laughs> um, but you can always email me and I'll drop my email in the chat. Um, I recently did write an article about Asian Americans in the environmental justice movement um, based on their experiences at the 1981 conference. So if you want to um, if you want to read it, just shoot me an email and I can send it to you. I can't publish it anywhere because of, you know, academic publishing rules, which are silly and dumb, but like yeah, just email me if you have any questions or you want to chat or I'm around, so yeah. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, yeah, so I actually have a, um, a link tree to, you know, my, my team and me, you know, basically this link tree, you know, has all the links and account, um, social media, all of that, and yeah. Thanks. Uh, I, I don't, did I say Wawa then Io? Let's go Wawa then Io. <laughs> oh, you're muted. I'm so sorry. My computer is very old and she just decided to stop working. So I'm on my phone, but I was trying to type in. Well, I would say um, um, you could follow Black Girl Environmentalist. I'll put our at in um, the description. You could also follow me. Um, I, to be honest, I'm still dealing with my own. Um, I'm very anxious online, so I don't post much, but hopefully I'll get to a point where I talk. <laughs> but um, my Twitter is at Wawa Cathero and Instagram is, I think, same thing, but with an underscore, but I'll put those in there. Um, yeah. Awesome. And then Io, I saw you drop the uh, the website to Wera in the in the chat. Anything else to add there? Yeah, I put my uh, LinkedIn um, uh, there in the chat. That's the best way to uh, maybe one of the good ways to get to get in touch with me. Um, also, um, yeah, the, the the website for Wera is in the chat. Um, so, uh, the um, Clean Energy and Climate Justice Director at, at Wera. Um, so there's a lot of good information you can see on the website there. Um, in addition to that, um, my brother and I uh, have been teaching uh, Zumba for the past um, um, two years, a little more than two years. And we've uh, really uh, been able to connect it to um, unity and solidarity in the uh, EJ and CJ movements and have been able to um, even teach a, a class out in Houston, Texas with the fine folks of the um, Environmental um, Justice Leadership Forum that um, We Act for Environmental Justice does. That's mm -hmm. a great folks that are connected to that. Um, and, in, and around here in the state with some different folks, um, um, just promoting those things, uh, unity and solidarity um, in the face of this movement and in the face of the, uh, um, COVID, is, we just kept people apart physically so that we can still um, 
um, fellowship um, through the NetWaves. So you can check out my um, um, Instagram um, account in regards to that also there. I'll, I'll drop it in, in the chat. So it's good to see everybody today. Thank you. Thank you all. One one quick thing, Io. Uh, do you have any details for any upcoming summit info for, for NCEJN? Um, no, I do not. Um, I think they'll be having uh, some sort of a hybrid summit. I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm not sure exactly what's, um, sure. what's um, happening with that. Okay, no worries. I'll look up some info and, and try to add it to the discussion boards because that's another really great environmental justice conference that's right. been going for, for a long time. Yeah, um, years. So thank, thank you all panelists, uh, Lisa, Io, Carlos, Wawa. Your words have been inspirational. They, they've, you know, they've been real talk. It, I've really enjoyed it, uh, and I'm sure the audience has as well. Um, with that, I will close this out for this session. We will now go into our plenary, which is not in this room. You'll have to go. Uh, well, I can, I can actually do y'all a solid and drop the link uh, in, a, in, a, in a moment. Um, so we'll be going to the, the plenary session, which is the Donor of Color Network how do we get EJ funded? Um, and so that'll be in the main room, the same conference room that we were in this morning. And I'm still looking to, to grab the link for you all. Uh, huh. Too many windows open. Should be able to find it on the Whova website. If you, if you aren't able to get it through Whova, stick around, I'll eventually dig it up. But if you've already got it and you know where you're trying to go, then feel free to leave. Um, thank you all for, for this. Take care. All right, let me find that link. Hmm. Okay. There's that, and I will also put it on the, the Whova page for anyone who might have been in the, in the Whova for this session. And that starts at 3.40, so you got eight minutes. I will take a water break. I'm gonna close out this session. Thank you all, take care. <laughs>